You are listening to the Dare to Love podcast with your hosts, Sonica Tinker and Christian Peterson, founders of LoveWorks. Hi, and welcome, everybody. This is Christian Peterson. I'll be your host today on the Dare to Love podcast. I am especially thrilled and honored to have a very special guest with me today, Dr. Robert Glover, who is the author of the No More Mr. Nice Guy. So I will uh, introduce uh, Robert here briefly, and then we'll get to hear from Robert. So Dr. Robert Glover is the author of the best-selling book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. His website, drglover.com, features numerous online self-help courses, workshops, podcasts, groups, and trained coaches and therapists. Dr. Glover lives in Puerto Vallarta in Mexico. And I will just add that I have been a huge fan and admirer of your work for a long time. I think it's absolutely brilliant. So thank you very much for being here. And I'm really glad I get to talk to you. Oh, Christian, thanks for the invitation. I've been looking forward to talking with you as well. Yeah, me too. So maybe you could just start us off briefly by saying, uh, how did you arrive at talking about No More Mr. Nice Guy and developing this whole body of work? All right. Well, I I, I am a recovering nice guy. Yeah. Uh, if you had met me uh, 25, 30 years ago, I, I would have told you that. And I would have been proud of that. I would have said, I'm a nice guy. I'm one of the nicest guys you'll ever want to meet. And um and, you know, I thought that was a, a good model for living my life. It made sense to me. I was trying to, to be different from my father, mm -hmm. uh, who, I, who I grew up hearing my mother complain about constantly. Right. Uh, I was trying to be different from all the bad men out there who I heard women complain about constantly. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll be a nice guy. I'll, I'll, I'll treat people well. I'll avoid conflict. I'll, I'll be generous. I'll give to other people. I'll listen to them talk about their problems. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, there's, uh, there's some real flaws in, in the program, in that roadmap of trying to be a nice guy to, to get people's approval and validation. I was, I was going to say, when you present it like that, it sounds pretty good. Yeah, it, do, it does sound good. And, and you know, why, why wouldn't you want to be that way? And I didn't understand how come everybody else wasn't like that. Um, and where, where really things turned around was in my second marriage, um, I, I was, you know, helping to raise my second wife's kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to treat her well. I took pride in treating her better than her ex did. I tried to make her happy, tried to please her, avoided conflict. Um, but I was often kind of frustrated and resentful because it seems like I could never make her happy. It was never mm -hmm. good enough. I seemed to give a lot more than I got back. And um, she was angry all the time. She never wanted to have sex anymore. And, um, and I remember I spent the first few years of that marriage giving it six more months to get better or I was going to get out. And, and mm -hmm. I just kind of kept giving it six more months to get better. And then um, she is the one that actually uh, kind of uh, was the impetus or the big stick upside my head to, yeah. to change all of this. <laughs> and she, she told me, she said, I've had enough of your passive aggressive behavior. She says, you know, I, I'd rather be with a jerk. At least I know a jerk's going to treat me badly all the time. You mm. treat me well. And people think you're an amazing guy. And then you turn around and you do things that are really hurtful. You, you, mm. you, you hurt my feelings. You embarrass me. You're, you're passive aggressive. You said, you need to go work on that or I'm going to leave. And well, I, I didn't, even though I had been thinking about leaving, um, yeah. I, I didn't want to lose the marriage. And so I, I actually uh, went and joined a 12 step group and got into therapy. And for, I mean, I went trying to find out why me being a nice guy didn't make my wife appreciate me more or treat me better or want to have more sex. Why didn't that work? Now, luckily, and I was imagining that must have hurt hearing her say, I'd rather be with a jerk or, you know, well, of course it did. Cause I thought I was doing all everything right and being the good guy. And, um, I thought, well, this, this should work. And, mm -hmm. um, luckily I, I got into some good situations that quickly helped me see, uh, where my paradigm was flawed or what I was doing wasn't working well and wasn't going to work well. Yeah. Um, and I started learning about being honest, about making my needs a priority, about being more upfront about what I wanted, about right, having, right. having good boundaries, of, uh, and, and just things that, that the average nice guy doesn't do. And, yeah. um, and so out of that, as I started doing my own work, 
I started noticing as a marriage and family therapist, um, a lot of the couples coming to me for couples therapy, um, the guy was saying a lot of the same things I said. I'm a nice guy. I treat her well. I raise her kids. I'm I'm better than her ex. How come she's never happy? How come she's angry? It wasn't just you. And I thought, well, you know, I can finish these guys' sentences for them. It wasn't just me. So I started um, oh, 20 something years ago, my first no more Mr. Nice Guy men's group. And we met mm-hmm. every other Wednesday night. And I just started writing some chapters or lessons. Maybe nowadays we would call them blogs. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I just started writing some articles about what I was discovering on my own journey. And I mm-hmm. just started giving them to these guys every other week when we met. And over time, Um, these guys and often their girlfriends and wives were saying, Hey, you should write a book. You should go on Oprah. There's a lot of guys that that, (laughs) that need this information. So over a period of about six or seven years, I kept writing and, um, and then finally it did turn into a book and, uh, came out in, in hardcover in 2003, just about now, uh, what would that be? 15 years ago this month. Um, 16 even. So, oh man, my math skills suck. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you're right. It is 16 years. And uh, well, I'm glad you turned it into a book because that is a seminal piece of work. You know, it's one of those things where you can tell where the title of your book has become ingrained in language now. You know, don't be such a nice guy, or he's a real Mister Nice Guy. I think that's that's a good sign of. Uh, that you really struck a nerve in the culture. Well, it's very curious to me, at least, that um, when I was shopping the book, it took about three years to get it published, and oh, a, lo- it really? a, a lot of um, publishing companies, you know, editors said, "Well, you know, we really like the book, um, but our marketing department says that men won't buy a self-help book." And um, I, I said, "You don't know the guys I'm writing to," and yeah. you know, like I said that was that was you know, 16 to 20 years ago. And the book continues the, my royalty checks get bigger every year. So, uh, it continues after 16 years, uh, which is rare for most books. Um, Mm -hmm. it continues to, to sell more and more every year. And as you and I were talking, I think it's really become part of a foundation of, of just a a booming world of men's work that's going on worldwide now. So, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, hey, I'm I'm very grateful for your contribution to that. That's that's just been so valuable. Hey, I wanted to ask you know one of the premises you share in the book, uh, right from the beginning and right through, uh, you all sometimes some places you call it the, like the nice guy paradigm, and it, it goes something like, nice guys believe that if they're good and do everything right and hide their flaws, they will be loved, get their needs met, and have a problem free life. Say more about that. That's a really curious statement to me. It's like, yeah. I believe I do. If I do everything right, then I'm going to have a lovely life free of problems and full of love and I'll get what I want. Yeah. Let me break it down even further. Please. And, and, and a, a lot of people have told me, and I, and I believe this, that, that that piece that you just referred to for a lot of people is one of the biggest takeaways for the book. Uh, from the book. And, and I break that down into what I call covert contracts and, mm-hmm that's a summation of the three covert contracts that I believe all nice guys are pretty much most all nice guys have. And, and I, I don't, I'm not this clear about it in the book, but I've sensed as I continue to do my own nice guy work and work with other nice guys, here are the three covert contracts. And as I said, they're covert, meaning mm-hmm. the nice guy himself often is not conscious of the contract right. and nobody else is. Um, and they're all if then propositions. The Uh first one, covert contract number one is if I'm a good guy, then I will be liked and loved. And we can add a caveat to that. And the women I desire will desire me. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a good guy, people will like me, uh, covert contract number two, if I meet other people's needs without them having to ask, then they will meet my needs without me having to ask. Now, th- this is messed up on, on many mm-hmm. levels. One is that often we're giving to get. We're giving to get approval, to get validation, to solve somebody else's problems. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they don't know that there are strings attached. They don't know that, oh, we're, they're supposed to be giving back in return. They're supposed to be reading our mind as well. And mm-hmm. so, so not only is the fact that this is covert, um, that ensures that it doesn't work, but there's another problem here. And that nice guys are actually usually pretty bad at letting other people give to them. 
yeah. all, all the while we're wanting people to give as much as we give. Um, pretty much every woman I've ever been with has told me, you're really difficult to give to. Uh, <laughs> I, I've had to practice letting people give to me. For most nice guys, it makes them feel like they're bad, they're doing something wrong, they're going to be in trouble, it triggers their shame, their guilt, they're going to owe something. So that's covert contract number two. If I meet everybody else's needs without them having to ask, then they will meet my needs without me having to ask. Mm -hmm. Covert contract number three is that if I do everything right, then mm -hmm. I will have that smooth, problem-free world. Now, the, the flaws in that logic is number one, uh, Nobody's perfect. Nobody's going to do everything right. And how do you even know what that is? Um, yeah. And we don't live in a smooth, smooth, problem-free world. We live in a chaotic, ever-changing world. And uh, But nice guys have this almost OCD-like magical thinking. If I just get it right, everything will work out well. It'll it'll stay smooth and, and you know, always be exactly what I want it to be. It's a, it's a very immature Peter Panish way of viewing the world i was like i was gonna yeah how do we get that like how how does that get how does that get these contracts get installed in us in the first place well i my theory is is that that most of this begins at a really really early age maybe yeah maybe you know uh maybe before birth uh, for sure in the first few months of life and my theory is is what happens all ch all children do what i'm about to describe um, mm -hmm. Because all children are, are, are narcissistic by nature. They are the center of their universe. They, yeah. um, they're very grandiose. And now I'm saying all this as if they're, they're, these little children are reasoning all this out. They don't. This just occurs yeah, right. at a very emotional level before the reasoning brain is even developed. Um, but th it's this grandiosity that they believe they cause everything that happens in their world, for good or for bad. And mm -hmm. so... All children, when they experience negative things, painful things, uncomfortable things, abandonment, uh, parents are angry, fighting, uh, neglect, whatever it might be, anything that makes a child uncomfortable, there's an internalization that they are the cause of that. Mm -hmm. and, and if they're the cause of it, they also should be able to be the solution to it as well. It's the, it's the two sides of the kind of grandiose, um, yeah, yeah. narcissistic, emotional thinking of, of, a, of a baby, of a child. So children inaccurately internalize a lot of beliefs about themselves and the world. All children do this. Now, all children develop different survival mechanisms, defense mechanisms for coping with those things that make them uncomfortable. And, and they're trying to usually do two things, again, at a very unconscious level because their reasoning brain isn't developed. They're trying to um, soothe the, the discomfort they're feeling in the here and now. And the other thing they try to do is prevent these uncomfortable feelings from occurring again in the future. Mm -hmm. And for nice guys, that tends to, to take on two... Um, Two, two, two strategies. One is trying to become what they believe other people think they, you know, what they think other people want them to be in order to, you know, get their needs met, get love and, and have, you know, uh, a fairly hopefully predictable and unscary life. Mm -hmm. And the other is to hide whatever about them they think causes negative reactions from other people. So the nice guy's trying to become what they think other people want them to be, whether that's being good, peaceful, smart, funny, engaging, loving, you know, whatever it is, I'll become that. And whatever I think tends to trigger negative things, I'll hide that. Yeah. And, and for nice guys, uh, the two main things they tend to hide the most are their needs and their sexuality, which, um, as you can, might imagine, leads to a, a, a lot of issues. Yes, indeed. So, yeah, I, I can easily imagine that and relate to it from my own my own journey for sure. So how do you how do you think what how does this show up in in men's relationships? So in their inti I'm, I'm thinking chiefly of their, you know, their ma intimate relationships with their partners. How, how does uh, the not so nice sides show themselves? Well, let, let's kind of break that down into how it shows up first and then then the not so nice part, the. Um, how it shows up, I, I would say that probably most of the time men find me and my work, whether it's my book, my podcast, my classes, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
they find my work at, at, at some period of distress, often around relationship. Yeah. Now, sometimes it's guys that are distressed because um, they can't, you know, get a girlfriend. They mm -hmm. can't get laid and they're distressed about that. And so they go looking for answers and at times they find my work. Uh, other times guys are, are struggling in their relationship. Um, and you know, they, they aren't happy. They aren't satisfied. Maybe they're mm -hmm. not getting as much sex as they thought they were going to get. Maybe their wife's never happy. Uh, and so maybe they go looking for answers and find my work. Another real common time is, is often when men have gone through a breakup, uh, mm -hmm. breakup of relationship, maybe a divorce. And at that time, men often go seeking for answers as well. So the whole nice guy syndrome really does seem to manifest itself in terms of our, our relationship dynamics and especially our relationship struggles, whether mm -hmm. it's our difficulty attracting uh, a good woman, uh, finding a girlfriend, finding love, um, finding a sexual partner, uh, having a satisfying uh, intimate long-term relationship or going through the crisis of a breakup. That That is where often nice guys get most kind of in tune with their nice guy patterns. Now, how it tends to affect us at each of those stages, for example, uh, a single guy will often try to use what I call nice guy seduction to try mm -hmm. to get yeah, a girlfriend. Yeah, say more about that. Yeah, to, you know, and this is how they're trying to find a girlfriend. And this is what, what I did for many years. So I was like mm -hmm. in my 40s. Um, and that is, is, is kind of as it says, they're, they're going to be the nice guy. Maybe mm -hmm. they think that, as I used to think that a woman would be lucky to have me, but I didn't know why one would want me. There's that, that basic core sense of inadequacy. <clears throat> and we think, well, women only go for the jerks. They only go for, you know, the really good looking guys or the guys with six pack abs or a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think, so for me and for a lot of nice guys, the whole nice guy seduction is I'll be different. Uh, yeah. I'll be different from the guys I've heard women complain about. I'll listen to them talk about their problems. I'll do things for them. I'll, 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 I'll help them solve their problems. I'll, I'll, I'll be patient and, you know, I'll be a caretaker. I'll be a fixer. And, and we think that, it, you know, if we just kind of go real slow, hide our sexual agenda, be different than the jerks, then the woman will see what a great guy we are and want to be our girlfriend and maybe want to take her clothes off. Um, yeah, I'm you know, maybe maybe I can. Can I add a little piece, a little piece here? Add a piece for sure. Yeah, you know, I just I have a sense that through my own process and all the men I've worked with that, you know, we all as men, many of us can relate to growing up with, you know, with fathers who either weren't available or just downright angry and whatnot. And we, you know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to just, you know, when you look out in the world, how how I think about it is there are so many examples of misuse or abuse of masculine power in the world, whether it's, you know, corporate or on the government level or national level, or just in, when you look at crime and violence and abuse, it's, it's a lot of, uh, very often it's men out there doing the perpetration. And I, I think that, you know, us nice guys, you might say, or just men in general, we look at that and we really don't want to be like that. And in, in our attempts to really not be like that, it's as if we, we shut down our whole internal power plant. Yes. That's, and, that's and a good way the, to put it. Yeah. And, so, and, I, and, and what happens, and, you know, and I know that you, you kind of work on these issues with, with men around claiming their power. For, for the nice guy, we, we see power as being abusive. Um, right. and, and being hurtful, especially to women. And so we don't want to be that guy for, for, you know, for good reason. But unfortunately, when we shut off our power, part of which comes from our, our, our sexual self, if we try to mm -hmm. hide that, repress it, keep it away and approach women, quote, nicely, unfortunately, nice doesn't turn women on. It doesn't activate mm -hmm. their, their biological impulses to, to want to connect. They don't, they don't feel protected or safe or, 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 you know, energetically penetrated by us. Um, mm -hmm. and so we're, we're trying this nice guy seduction. And what often happens is, as you, many men complain, you know, we, we end up in the friend zone, i.e. the, either the woman doesn't know we even exist, or she just, she only calls us when she wants to talk about her problems or needs help right. moving. Uh, but I tell guys, women don't put men in the friend zone. Men put themselves in the friend zone. By, yeah. by repressing their power, their sexual desire, and by trying to, to just 
by repressing who they are uh, and yeah. trying to be the opposite of something that they're not. Um, so that's. I, I remember you saying something in your book that something like, you know, women often end up longing for the nice guy, but lusting for the tough guy. Yeah, you, man, you've paraphrased it a little bit, and but that that, yeah, that yeah, is I, true. I'm, I'm doing that from memory. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's true. Is is that you know even those may not sound politically correct. I mean, a million and a half years yeah, of, of evolution has wired women to look to men to be protector and provider. Now, a lot of women can provide for themselves; they can take care of themselves, but mm -hmm. they're still evolutionarily wired to be attracted to something bold or fierce or uh, are highly energetic in men. You know, a man that's comfortable in his own skin, that has a sense of mm -hmm. confidence, a, a sense of purpose and passion in the world. That is that, I remember you saying that too, there's no better aphrodisiac than a self-confident man. Yeah. Or just confidence, period. Just confidence. Um, it, it's, it's wired into women, just like we men, if we see boobs, we get turned on. Women see confidence, they get turned on. It's just wired in. We don't have to think about, do we like boobs? It just happens. Women don't mm -hmm. have to think about, do they like confidence? It is wired into them. So there, yeah. there's that's probably the first relation area that, that being a nice guy doesn't work well. And that, that's in trying to attract women. Yeah. And actually, I want to I want to ask another thing that uh, what you said reminded me of, you know, this we always trying to not be the ones who abuse power and to be uh, aggressive like that. And I, I remember even from my own process through my 20s at I, you know, I was trying my damnedest to be a nice guy and, you know, be polite and well mannered. And that, however, that did not mask all the anger I had inside. Yeah. I was just, I was really good at keeping a straight face and not yelling at people, but I was often cooking inside. And the only, it was as if, it was as if there was nothing in between being, I have this thing, I called it like a, either you're like the dick, the, the doormat to a dick spectrum or yeah. jerk a little more uh, not so crass perhaps yeah. but it was as if i was either one or the other you know i was nice 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 and then sometimes i just couldn't contain myself anymore if i got whatever too drunk or something you know and i would just unleash my anger on some innocent bystander almost so it was and, and, that, and i wonder if that's a common thing it and is also if it is yeah, and that, i could never find the place in between or beyond those two extremes well let's talk about that um yeah and i, I kind of you know use similar terminology i you know we either go from the wussy doormat to the asshole jerk and and here's the thing and, and i talk about this real early in the book that nice guys fundamentally are anything but nice for a number of reasons one we're, we're not honest we're not congruent. Mm -hmm. You know, we're holding our finger up to see which way the wind's blowing and then trying to be that. We're chameleons. But the core piece and, and that you've mentioned, and that this was really what my second wife was confronting when she said, I can't take it anymore, was, mm -hmm. was my combination of passive aggressiveness and what she called my victim pukes. Um, the passive aggressive is the yeah. passive aggressive is the stuff you don't see coming. Um, it's kind of mm -hmm. like it's, it's the cut down, it's the biting remarks, it's the embarrassing them in public. Uh, is you know you say something and and you know, her feelings get hurt and say I was just kidding, you know. But mm -hmm. but it hurt, you know. It's kind of like you know they they've got all these little daggers in their back, you know. All these all yeah, these right. you know it's not one big cut. Is it's just a lot of little slices. That's mm -hmm. passive aggressive behavior, and nice guys are just the kings of that. Because as you said, we're trying our best to not be that jerk, to not be that asshole, to not be that that angry, abusive, controlling man. So we got this this big lid on the stuff. But but you know, if we're doing all this giving to get, and we don't think we're getting back our share, and if we're tolerating bad behavior, that's going to build up, and so it's going to come out in that passive aggressive way, and it also comes out in the victim pukes, and maybe that's kind of what you're talking about, where it just builds, it builds until you know the the, the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back, just it blows up, and it all just mm -hmm. comes puking out of us. And and I remember my my second wife used to ask me after one of my victim pukes when I just kind of unloaded everything that had ever bothered me uh, mm -hmm. and maybe called her some so a few very not nice names she would even say you know um how long have you been feeling this way and, yeah. and i go i don't know, I don't know six months maybe <laughs> and she'd go you mean you, it never crossed your mind to maybe talk to me about this yeah. stuff and i'll go 
actually, no, it never did cross my mind. I rehearsed it a lot in my head, but it never crossed <laughs> yeah. my mind that maybe I should just talk to you about this. So yeah. that, that's, that, there's, there's another core problem there in the, the way that nice guys are, um, both in intimate relationship, but also this can happen at work, it can happen in friendship. When we keep all of this stuff in, trying to, to not be the asshole jerk, that, that energy still has got to go somewhere. And so what mm -hmm. happens is a lot of guys come to me and they'll say, okay, you know, I've, I've read the book. I understand that being a nice guy is, is not healthy. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not the answer, but, but I don't want to be the, the jerk either. You know, I don't want to be the mm -hmm. dick either. Yeah. Uh, so they go, you know, so I, you know, I, I want to find, you know, that, that, that happy, you know, place in between the two. And, and my response to that is I don't know where the, the tipping point is between two toxic extremes. Um, so just being kind of halfway in between being a jerk and being a wussy doormat isn't the answer because right. really what's going on here, at least in my theory, is that the, the nice guy and the jerk are actually a lot alike. And here's how is that they're both managing their anxiety in, mm -hmm. in dysfunctional ways. The nice guy tends to manage his inner anxiety in what we might call the fight or flight mode yeah. of survival, you know, kind of keeping the low profile, avoiding the conflict, trying to, you know, you know, get, get things settled quickly. If there's any kind of distress, whereas the, what we might call the jerk or the dick tends to manage their anxiety externally through dominance mm -hmm. and violence through fight. Okay. So we got fight, flight, and freeze and nice guys are flight and freeze. The asshole is fight, but they're really all on the same spectrum. They're all just trying to manage their uncomfortable anxiety states. And so mm -hmm. we actually, to, to break out of either of those patterns, we've, we've got to, I, I draw a diagram usually before we rise up above that to, to, we could call it anything we want. I call it an integrated male. Uh, David data calls it third stage male, you mm -hmm. know, authentic man. You know, there's a lot of different terminology. It doesn't matter what we call it. But, but there's a combination of things there, including our ability to soothe our anxiety, to act as a differentiated person and ask ourselves what feels right to me, to follow through on that, to have boundaries. Um, so there's, there's, there's other practices that can help us kind of rise up above that ping-ponging um, between either being the wussy doormat or the asshole jerk and having to express all of our inner feelings, either through passive aggressive behavior or through victim pukes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I really like that. <laughs> it's funny when you say it like that victim pukes, it's a good, I, I can really hear, I don't, I really don't want to be someone who does that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not pretty, uh, you know, no. and then usually after a nice guy has a victim puke, they feel like, shit and so you know then they go back to the doubling down on the nice guy trying to make good trying to convince the other person oh i'm sorry i didn't mean it you know and, you know doubling down on treating them well and doing things for them and it just starts the cycle all over again yeah you know the, well that's the thing you know I, I i've seen that you know really like men we just in the love we're looking for, because uh, you know, like you say in your in beginning paradigm, you know, we basically, basically had the good intention to look for a ways to get loved, and connected and accepted. I remember there was a man in one of our workshops who said, you know, I never wanted to look inside because I always thought if I looked into that big black bag, I would find something nasty and ugly. And if anybody else saw it, they would not want to have anything to do with me. But he said, when I really dared to look. All I found was that it was just kind of an empty hole that really just needed to f be filled with some love and connection. You know, and that, that's, that's really what we're looking for is love and connection. That, I mean, that, that's not a, a terrible agenda to have in life. And But as, as I've talked about, you know, for a lot of nice guys beginning at a very early age, we thought even our most basic needs were bad. Uh, right. and, and we especially believe our sexuality is bad. And so we do really repress it and keep it pushed down, but that stuff still got to come out. I mean, it mm -hmm. is, there's a lot of energy there. And I remember one conversation I had again with my second wife, uh, you know, ways into our marriage. I'd started doing quite a bit of my work by that time. And I, I don't, I can't even remember now the, why I asked her the question I did. Maybe I was, um, you know, trying to set a situation up where I could go get away with something. I'm not sure. But, but I asked her, I said, you know, if you could like do 
anything, if there's any like off limits, taboo thing that you could do and there'd be no consequences for, what would it be? And she's looked back at me and said, I'm going to ask you the same question. She didn't even answer. <laughs> I think she knew. She was pretty intuitive in a lot of ways. I think she knew I was setting her up in some way. And I, I, I can't even remember what the setup was. But she just said, well, how about what would you do? And really, without even having to think about it or hesitating, I said, uh, I'd probably go take a look at my dark side. Mm. And she said, I doubt that there's anything that you would find that I don't already know is there. Yeah. And, and like you were saying that, that this person you worked with, he was afraid that if anybody saw what was in there, they're going to be repulsed and push us away. And really, this comes down to really the whole dynamic of, of why it doesn't work for the nice guy. And, and, it, it, and it actually points, it shines a light on what, what the work is we need to do. We think if anybody sees how we really are, or at least how we think we must really be, they're going to be disgusted, repulsed. They're going to abandon us, abuse us, mm -hmm. neglect us, hate us, not love us, whatever. The, the truth is everything we do to try to become what we think other people want us to be and hide everything we think might, you know, get a negative reaction makes it next to impossible for people to love us, to just be close mm -hmm. to us, to, 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 to connect on a human level. Humans connect with each other around our flaws, our imperfections, our rough edges. And it is actually, and you know this working with men, you know it doing your own work. When we actually do go take a look at that dark side, when we actually do start getting real and vulnerable and honest and transparent, all of a sudden, we become more attractive. We become more yeah. interesting. Um, people start wanting to be around us. Uh, women start showing high interest in us. And then we start thinking, what planet have I just landed on? You mean, is this mm -hmm. easy? And, and it truly is, I, I don't know if paradoxical is the right word, probably, that everything a nice guy does to try to get love, get their needs met, and have a good life, creates just the opposite reaction. So they just mm -hmm. do more of the same, hoping for different results, kind of that whole insane paradigm. Um, yeah. and, and, and paradoxically, when we start opening up to safe people, start revealing ourselves, learning to trust, learning to accept ourselves as we are, getting more accurate feedback, you know, that, mm -hmm. that we are lovable, we are good people, and, and we don't have to try to be good. You know, yeah, we're going to do stuff that is hurtful. As, as a good friend of mine a few years back was kind of helping me through, you know, a difficult situation that I had created. He said, mm -hmm. he said, Robert, he said, he kind of held out one hand. He said, you can be an ass. And then he held out his other hand. He said, but you're not an ass. He said, when you can integrate those two things, you'll, you'll have a handle on this. You'll, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get it. And that's true. When we can acknowledge it, I can be an ass. I can, I can be a dick. I, I, I can, I can, you know, have sexual lust. I, I, I can have perversion. I, and it, but if I can just look at that and let it come up to the surface where it's in the light of day, and I let other safe people see it, and they don't shame me for it, and they still accept me and still love me, it takes the power out of it. And and that's when we, when we can become genuinely good men that can genuinely mm -hmm. make a difference in the world, that, that, that can generally um, be alive and sexual with a woman, but also, you know, be, be, be respectful and, and, you know, recognize boundaries and, and not be coercive. Uh, it, it truly is transformative when we can just bring all that stuff that, that we've kept down in the dark and bring it out in the light. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, it's something I learned from my wife. She always says that, we uh, we have this misunderstanding. It seems most of us humans that you know, when we look at when we look at other people who dare to get vulnerable and share their fears and tears and as as well as their light, you know, we we immediately we we are drawn to people who dare to be vulnerable and honest and real. Mm -hmm. but, but we have a fear that if we're the ones doing that, the reaction is going to be the exact opposite. So there's just this internal misunderstanding that I love it when everybody else does it, but if I were to do it, I'm going to be rejected and left behind. That that is such ridicule. Yeah, and that's such a good point, and it really goes back to that childhood conditioning that 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 you know we think of anybody that we are the cause of people 
But the truth is, those were those were inaccurately internalized beliefs as children. We mm -hmm. were not the cause of mom and dad fighting. We were not the cause of mom being depressed or sad. We were not the cause right. of dad being a drunk. We were not the cause of our parents separating. We were not the cause of our younger brother being sick and needing, you know, all the parental attention. We were not the cause of any of those things. Um, yeah. And, and that, that, that is a big piece of the work that I think probably pretty much most human beings most adults have to do is is to clean that stuff out and and to learn to accept and embrace you know we're, we're imperfect we're perfectly imperfect we're flawed and very lovable human beings and as you're yeah. right it, it's kind of easier to, when you were saying that i was thinking i remember the first time i saw um Brene brown's ted talk on, mm -hmm. on yeah. i think it was on vulnerability and just like like I fell in love with her watching her on that TED talk. I thought, Immediately, how, how yeah. could you not love this person? They're they're so vulnerable and they're so just out there. And 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 you're right. It's attractive that kind of vulnerability and ability to to be playfully poke fun at yourself and talk about your flaws and your mistakes and and when you've been an asshole, you know, to just put it out there is actually endearing and attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good material. Um, I want to ask you about the if you are a partner of a nice guy, you know, if you are his whichever kind of partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, maybe even a kid. But, you know, most of the ones who come to us are their intimate mm -hmm. partners. How, how does how does how can she work with a nice guy or how can a partner recognize hmm, something is going on and particularly how can they support something better to arise? Yeah, that's a good question. And it, it really is a challenge and it and is one that, that, that I've had to help a lot of people struggle with. And, and honestly, yeah, I know not, a lot of nice guys don't necessarily want to be helped. You know, a lot of men don't want to be helped. It's that's another thing. I have this, I have the sense that men often operate on this kind of emergency principle yeah. that something terrible has to happen. You know, there's got to be a, my house has got to be on fire before I actually do something. And that, and that's kind of what I was saying about when most nice guys, when most men find my work is when they're in relational crisis of yeah, some exactly. sort. Um, and, and, and why that's a difficult, challenging question. And, and by the way, when I talk with women about, nice guys about, you know, about my book or what nice guys are. Um, I, I usually get one of two responses from women. The first is, is women that kind of look at me like, what are you talking about? There's men like that out there, you know, and these are the women that are attracted to the jerks and the bad boys. Uh, that's mm -hmm. all they know. You know, they just keep being drawn in and, and the nice guys aren't even on their radar. Um, but then the, the other kind of women, oh, man, they, you just you just see this kind of look of recognition on their face like, oh, yeah, that's my dad or that's my brother or that's, that's my husband mm -hmm. or often that's my ex. Um, and and, yeah. and the, they get it. They get that that passively pleasing behavior, the avoidance of dealing with anything that really needs to be dealt with, the lack of follow through, the, the passive aggressive behavior, the victim pukes. They get it. Um, mm -hmm. And and. Often people ask, well, are there nice girls out there, too? And I say, well, there, there, there were nice girls, I think, out there long before there were even nice guys. And, and maybe a lot of us nice guys were trained to be that way by our nice girl mothers, which I was. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I remember uh, after I got divorced in 2003 and got out there and started dating, I remember, you know, dating a few women that were nice girls. I quickly found out they were nice girls. You know, that I, I'd, I'd propose some options. And they go, oh, whatever you want to do is fine. You know, well, mm -hmm. tell me, yeah. what, do you prefer this one or that? Well, no, whatever you want is okay. Or, you know, I, they'd seem to maybe be a little bothered by, I said, you bothered by something or something on your mind? Oh, no, no, no. And, you know, after a while, I thought, man, I, I had great empathy for what I put my first two wives through, mm -hmm. through all my nice guy behaviors where I, it wasn't nice. So in terms of women, what to do with this, here's, here's the, the, another paradox, um, it, if a woman tells her man, you're a nice guy, you have to change, and he does it to please her, nothing has changed. Right. He's, he's still in the nice guy trap. And, and I think a lot of women kind of intuitively get that. They get, well, you know, 
he's, he's always trying to please me. He avoids the issues. If I tell him, you know, he's got to stop pleasing me, he'll do that to try to please me. Um, and, and I think they kind of get it. And yeah, I think we can just all, you know, we, I think we can all, we all have this body barometer that can just sense when, you know, when there's not, con- what do you, what is that word? Congruence. congruence. Yes. And women are especially what is being said yeah. and what's really going on. Women really get that lack of in- incongruence in men. They feel it in their body and it feels bad to them. Um, so here, here's actually the advice I have given the most to women. Um, and that is just give them my book. Um, it's the simplest way, you know, I, and actually I've had a lot of men come to me and work with me, workshops, you know, seminars or classes or email me and they'll say, you know, uh, my ex gave me the book or my wife gave me uh, your book. Mm-hmm. And, and at least the ones that contact me are never like offended by that. For some of them, it's too late in terms of that relationship because it's, it's yeah. already ended. But a lot of guys find my book because a woman gave it to them. And so I, I tell women, if you're in a relationship, dating a nice guy, married to a nice guy, and you see the patterns, you, 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 know, you, you get the fallout of it, of him not being so nice, um, just give him a copy of the book. And don't say a lot more about it than that. Just say, hey, mm-hmm. uh, I love you. I'd like you to read this book. Um, if you want to talk about it, I'm open to talking about it. But here, please read it. And then let it go. Um, and then, you know, if he reads it and sees himself in it and there's instructions in there for how to begin to take action on, on working with it. If he does that because he sees himself and knows he needs to do it. Boom. That's, that's good. It's healthy. Uh, mm-hmm. He'll go get whatever he needs. But, you know, if he's doing it purely because he thinks, OK, his wife says, now you have to do this. and Now you have to do that. Uh, he's still being a nice guy, just, you know, following this there's still this external direction rather than his own internal compass and trying to please somebody and make them happy. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right. Well, in wrapping up here, we're almost out of time. And I want to ask, you know, one, one final question is what, what would you say to a man? You know, if there's a man out there listening, um, you know, who knows that, life just isn't going as well as he would like it to, or who knows his relationship is just not going as well as he would like it to. He's not really able to connect with his power. And like, of course, get your book and read that. I I'd say I would give them a great, that's a great piece of advice because there's a great plan in there to follow. Other than that, what would you tell a man like that for how to start a, you know, start his journey to something. All right. Well, here's, here's where I tell every guy to start. And and that is don't try to do it alone. There, there's a a dynamic of the nice guy syndrome, because remember we've, we've kind of kept everything in and we don't want to be too vulnerable. We don't want to be too seen. Um, Mm -hmm. but I tell, I tell guys, we did not develop nice guy syndrome in social isolation and we're not going to resolve it in social isolation. We, we, we have to go out and put ourselves in a context of people to start working on the issues. Because one of the core things we have to work on is beginning to release our, our toxic shame. And our toxic shame is that is that part we internalize that says, I'm not good enough, I'm bad, I'm unlovable. Mm-hmm. And we have to find safe people and, and go begin revealing the things about ourselves that, w- that we're uncomfortable revealing. And that's where I started in a 12-step group is just revealing everything about me I'd, I'd, I'd never had shared with anybody. And, you know, this, this 12-step group met like at 6.30 in the morning. And, and mm-hmm. I got excited every week when it was time to go to group because, <laughs> I mean, like this was like, you know, an adult playground to just go start revealing myself. And, and it's like it felt liberating and just – just lightened my load and it's, it was, it was amazing. I, I, I loved it and it, it can be painful, but it, it, I, it was a, a great process. So don't try mm-hmm. to do this alone. We're, we men, well, men and women, both we're tribal. We, our, our, our ancestry for millions of years was in tribe. Men banded with other men to get things done. And men went through masculine initiation with other men to grow into the mature, functioning, masterful world of adult masculine. And 
and most men nowadays, especially nice guys, try to do it all alone. You're not going to mm. do this alone. So uh, you and I were talking before we, we started the recorder. When I, when I started my process about 25 years ago, there wasn't much out there. Um, there mm -hmm. weren't men's coaches. Uh, the Internet kind of existed, but about, about right. all the people did with that was look at porn and steal mu music on Napster. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so there wasn't like the plethora of men's coaches, men's online groups, men's po podcasts that wasn't out there. Um, and, and so it, it was challenging to, to find resources. Now is everywhere. You know, just go online and, and you know, you know, Google masculinity, wade through all the shit about mm -hmm. toxic masculinity and, and, you know, find men that are working with other men. Um, it, it, there's just a lot of good stuff out there. So go find a coach. I still work with a coach. Uh, I'm in a men's group. Uh, we, we meet about nine months out of the year. We, we go online every two weeks. We have three retreats. Um, I, I, I've been doing this work for over 20 years. I still need a coach. I still need a men's group. Mm -hmm. Um, and so don't do it alone. There are plenty of resources out there. Uh, yeah. You've mentioned my website. You know, have him send me an email. I've got an assistant. That's all he does is answer my emails and points people in the direction of getting, you know, resources to help them work on their stuff. Yeah. And I'll, of course, I'll put it in the notes to the podcast too. But just, just one more time, will you say your website? For yeah, people? it's just drglover.com. That's D-R-G-L-O-V-E-R.com. Wonderful. And I, yeah, great advice. I wholeheartedly support that ever since I started this process, I've been sitting in the same men's group for 11 oh, years, probably cool. we meet every week or every other week. And not only have I personally gotten tremendously supported, but it creates a, a, just an astonishing level of connection and bonding and brotherhood. Actually, I, I honestly used to think that kind of bonding and brotherhood between guys was just stuff of fairy tales and the knights of the round table but it's it's a real thing and we're just a bunch of regular guys yeah supporting supporting each other's yeah i i love that and you know and, and i i hear <clears throat> from so many nice guys that uh, you and i'll just say this briefly you mentioned that for a lot of nice guys we were disconnected from our fathers growing up and so for a lot mm -hmm. of nice guys we're, we're kind of intimidated by other men we kind of see all, you know, the alphas that are out there right. and, and we go, well, you know, guys will tell me, you know, I can't find any men to connect with because all men want to do is, you know, get together, drink beer, watch sports and talk about women, you know, maybe right. NASCAR. Um, and I go, no, that that's that's just a lie you've told yourself to keep you safe because you're 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 uncomfortable connecting with men, whatever your dad issues are, or whatever happened to you as a kid, if you were bullied or didn't fit in. But I honestly know both professionally and personally, there are multitudes of men out there that want to connect on a much deeper level than just drinking beer, objectifying women and watching sports. Um, yes. and, and it's not hard to find them. So that's an excuse. So if anybody's out there listening saying, well, yeah, you know, all men are, no, that's an excuse. Um, there's, and it's keeping you safe, but it's not taking you where you want to go in life. Yes. Well, that is a great note to end upon. So I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Glover, for spending a little time with me and our listeners here. And I want to appreciate you for the book you wrote and all the work you've been putting out there and all the men you've supported in, you know, in support of creating a different kind of masculinity. So thank you very much for all your work. You're welcome, Christian. And thanks for the invitation. I had a good time. Yeah, me too. And this is the end of our episode for today, friends. And uh, thanks for joining us and look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Dare to Love podcast. You have been listening to the Dare to Love podcast with your hosts, Sonica Tinker and Christian Peterson, founders of LoveWorks. And hey, if you found this podcast to be useful, would you go ahead and hit the share button and share this with your friends on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or wherever your favorite hangouts are. Thanks so much for sharing the love. And you can find more about our work at loveworksforyou.com. Thank you.